Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. And today, my distinguished guest is Patrick McNamara, who is the creative force, the writer and producer of Mage Animal House. How you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Gang, gang by, you know, that's all you can say in England. That's as enthusiastic as you can be about your day. I have spent not a lot of time in the United Kingdom. I was in an elevator and I was in business attire and another man just looked at me and went, all right. And that is the closest I have ever felt to being accepted in the entirety of the United Kingdom. And it mm. filled my heart with a stony, mossy tepidness, which I think, which I think is the, the appropriate feel. And That's hopefully you also have a good uh, list of stereotypal interactions with Americans. I've had, uh, I've been um, told that I was welcome for World War II. Okay. Um, Which was a real one. I just went, wow, I didn't think people really said that, but okay, <laughs> thanks, guy. Like, did you surf? <laughs> like, I got in a lot of trouble uh, with my father-in-law for describing a tour of Boston as a tour of great British victories. Because <laughs> we won a lot of those. Like, I know that overall, like, the war didn't go our way, but... If you travel in Boston, it's like, wow, it sounds like we were really kicking ass for a while there. Like, this was going great yeah, for the you, home team. You had the high score through most of the innings, even if right. you didn't ultimately win. Um, yeah, slow and steady, you know, with yeah. the race. I, I, I am envious somewhat of um, uh, the British Museum just because it was built during the finder's keepers phase. Of, oh, yeah. Of, uh, of world politics. Uh, yeah, they it, should give all that shit back, but they won't. <laughs> so, Patrick, what is Animal House. Animal House is a, uh, it's a mage live play of a fictional homebrew mage fifth edition that I created for the members only forum originally at Penny Arcade. Uh, we do a lot of actual play stuff there. The users on Patreon were originally given uh, a poll that said, what would you like to see first? Monsters, magic, or mice? And they chose magic, which is what I wanted them to choose. But I thought, well, they probably won't choose that because that's what I want. And accordingly, I then created a, a mage podcast. Animal House specifically is about a cabal of mages who are assigned a diplomatic mission in the town of Ballard and discover when they arrive at their new chantry that it has been leased out to a frat house. How did you encounter the opportunity to run this for Penny Arcade? And I guess, were you also going to be responsible if Mouse or Monster had been selected? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so at Penny Arcade, uh, I was a producer. I was okay. one of their in-house producers, along with bewilderingly talented senior produ producer called Alyssa Grant. So I had a pretty broad remit to create content for Club PA. So at that period, I was able to just say, hey, okay, I'm going to, I want to do this. And everyone went, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I said to Jerry, Jerry, do you want to play Mage? And he said, of course I want to play Mage. I love Mage. <laughs> it was luck, really. It was kind of, it was having a cool job where they, uh, they gave me broad creative freedom and they knew it was kind of a passion project. Yeah, I got very lucky. I would have enjoyed doing Mouse Guard or Monster of the Week, which were mm -hmm. the other two options. But Mage was definitely the one I wanted to do the most. So what is it like running a game for that crew? Uh, obviously, it is a group of people that have a fair bit of experience just being thrown a game and then playing it and having other Absolutely. people watch. It's interesting. that It has its own challenges, but one of, the, one of the great things about it is you know it's going to be a good table, and you know that everyone there is going to be on your side, which is a lesson I learned once when I once said, was the storyteller for Jason Carl, and I was terrified of doing that. And a friend of mine said, what you have there is a player who is absolutely not going to try and fuck you over. That kind of stuck with me. And that's how I kind of treat playing with a crew like that. Like, oh, you have a group of people who are very good at what they do. And there's not going to be anyone at the table who's trying to sabotage you. So in that sense, it's easier. I would say the challenging thing is that when you have four players like that, you can't give them the Mage 20 book and say, have fun, read all this, and then get back to me because he just won't do it, which is part of the reason why I ended up writing up my own quick start, because I thought, I think I have about five pages of buy-in. So how much mage can I teach people in five pages? <laughs> and I, I cribbed heavily from the uh, mage quick start that is on drive through RPG at the moment and wrote in little bits and pieces there, shortened that even considerably. Yeah, so th those are the kind of positives and negatives of it. Honestly, running a game for a crew like that is great. You know, they're so creative. Everyone there knew the kind of Penny Arcade house style very well which is the idea that it should feel like it should feel like a game that you're playing at home. You're looking over someone's shoulder, just watching their home game play. Even though, of course, as you know, as someone who runs an actual play, it's very different from running a home game. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's the illusion you want to create. 
And that is a crew that emphasizes that the characters for them seemingly are always taking the world deadly seriously, even if the players are not. And if there is humor, it is from that earnestness and it is never an insulting kind of humor. The characters are never mocked for their eagerness, but the ridiculous genuinely comes out a lot, which is avoids what I'll call the cheap laughs of an actual play. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that that you're so thoroughly uh, avoided that even if your characters were, were pretty heavy archetypes. And even if the characters themselves were tongue in cheek, they played it straight as it were one of those interesting things like if you use like an example like breaking bad that probably everyone has seen breaking bad is a show that takes itself very seriously it's also very funny Mm -hmm. and if you can create a world that takes itself seriously with that where actions have real consequences you can still find the humor in that and the humor can actually be sharper rather than if we kind of went in and went you know like and everyone's on and everyone's always trying to like, okay, who's can, who can say the funniest thing? That's something I don't like in some actual plays is when everyone's trying to push themselves forward and go, I'm the funny one. And then someone will like, or I'm, I'm going to do the most acting. And then someone else is pushing them aside going, I think I can do the most acting. And it becomes kind of a game of one-upmanship. This was almost the opposite. It was people, uh, the crew was pretty good at tossing the ball to one another yes. in terms of saying, well, what does your character think about this? Or, oh, what do you think Bloody Blah is getting up to yeah. this time? Uh, it, Kiko didn't seem like a particularly loud person, but it still seemed that they were able to hold the narrative spotlight enough because everyone else at the table was interested in that. And Kiko was in a lot of ways almost the linchpin of the show. Like he's there being being absolutely solid and he's playing a great character, which is a friend of character, Hugo Perez, who's a, a, a young youth and artist who works as a paramedic. And uh, Kiko is interestingly the one where when I gave him the five page quick start, he said, I need more. I sent him the M20 book um, and a copy of how do you how do you do that? And I believe he probably read them both cover to cover because that's just his personality. He said, mm. OK, now I can play this game. I understand. He played a great role of kind of playing the straight man around the rest of it. He's just a guy. He's he's eager. He's there to be serious and, and get his job done and lets the chaos sort of happen around him. There are a few things more terrifying than a earnest euthanatoy. Yeah, absolutely. And um, especially because uh, his grandmother was also seemingly a mage and possibly as well as a member of the Chakravanti. And upon mm-hmm. crucial plot twist, there was this moment where it was like, you need to burn the place down. And he's like, okay, grandma. And I'm like, yeah. that is terrifying. <laughs> I I love grandma Perez. That was Kiko's idea for a character. I guess I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself, but one of the things that we cribbed from Vampire 5th Edition mm-hmm. was... Um, this idea of touchstones, which is every every character comes up with, every player comes up with two touchstones that kind of represent their human convictions, which is essentially just giving the DM or the storyteller plot hooks. And it's very useful stuff. And one of his was Grandma Perez, which was just a great idea because he's a complete grandma's boy. And that informs the character a lot. He's a fan favorite, I think. Everyone likes it when you get to hear from Grandma. So you make mention of the fact that there are touchstones in in Vampire that is kind of in V5 that is a way of tying you your humanity to it. Do you feel it serves a similar role in Mage or is there a way in which it shifts in your head when being used for a mage or a will worker as opposed to a kindred? I would say that it, it functions the same way instead of in most cases it's just a slightly different context. So Instead of a humanity score, I had a wisdom score, which I cribbed from Awakening. I'm not much of an expert on Awakening, but I did grab a few of their ideas. And it was the idea that one of the kind of big watchwords of the show was hubris, which is the idea that you will get gradually less and less wise, the less cautious you are about using your magic and the less you follow your strong internal code. So especially in a long, I mean, this is a relatively short game. I think we recorded four episodes. In a longer term game, you might see that spiral down as people start just using their magic for everything violating their own moral codes and just embracing the chaos a little bit and becoming more distant from their humanity, but in a different way, where instead of a vampire degenerating and becoming a a ravenous beast, a mage just becomes more distant and less able to remember who they were or that humanity is something they should care about. Is that something you had mechanized? Like if the game had gone on long enough, Mm -hmm. does that come up? Uh, Can you give us a little description of how that works in for you or at least in your head yeah i stole it directly from v5 which would be that if the players or the player characters rather violate their own convictions 
which are also chosen by the, the player, the rules that they live by, they would achieve kind of stains on their wisdom. Like, for instance, one of the rules that everyone was required to follow was don't harm innocents and don't betray the cabal, which are kind of designed to prevent murder hoboing a little bit and prevent anyone from just being the character who's trying to fuck everyone over. And if they break those tenets, they might you say, okay, you, well, you have a stain on your wisdom. And then you roll your unspent wisdom boxes at the end of the at the end of the game and see whether or not you lost permanent wisdom by doing that. Now I might be fluffing that slightly because I haven't done a humanity check in V5 in a long time, but it's it's something along those lines where failing to follow your own convictions and the convictions of the game will lead to you gradually losing this wisdom score. I guess the big thing to me is, is that something where the higher your wisdom is, the harder it is to lose it or the easier it is to lose it? It's the easier, it's easier okay. to lose it. So as your hard. wisdom drops, it's hard to have it drop further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You grabbed heavily from V5. What made you look at V5 and say, I want to port this rather than run M20? Some of it was practical. Now I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about igniting Edition Wars, but, um, but the first time I had ever played a World Darkness game, I've been a fan of World of Darkness for a very long time, but I was the kind of fan who reads all the books and never gets a chance to play. The first time I got to play was V5. So we had three of the players at the table had already played V5 quite extensively. Jerry had played it in Seattle by Night, which was another Penny Arcade live play. Jasmine actually was the storyteller on the Geek and Sundry Guide to V5. So she's a recognized expert <laughs> at that system. And Tabby had played it with me for, for a long time. So part of it was, I don't want to have to teach these people a new system. Even the system for like basic roles is different. And the other thing was, I don't want to learn a different system. And there were, I think M20 is a little heavy. Literally. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I have the book here. It's, it's, it's huge. 696 like, pages or something like that. Yeah. But. So I kind of wanted to make it very playable and very fast. Mm -hmm. I was worried. It's interesting that, like, speaking to someone who runs their own Mage podcast and uses Mage 20, I would have assumed it was impossible. <laughs> but it's, uh, and so that was my thinking was, like, I won't be able to run it like this. This will be too complex. I need to keep it moving, keep it very snappy. And that was something that V5 did very, very well. I also thought that the special dice mechanics in V5 would be interesting when applied to Mage, where instead of, and I'm, I am certain that when they release a Mage 5th edition, they will have some kind of paradox dice system. It was easier to base it off V5. And once you decide you're homebrewing something, then you go, okay, well, what else can I do? What else can I add to make things a little bit easier? I also knew that the character creation had to be significantly simpler. So we used essentially V5 character creation with very few changes. I totally agree that M20 is is weighty. It is more game than I think we need. I, I think the accidental success, it, it, it almost had this producers-like thing where it was supposed to be the omnibus edition. It was supposed to tide us over until an M5. And then the worst possible thing happened. It became successful. Yeah. Uh, and it became people's entryway into the game. And uh, I appreciated earlier when you said you, you started with the quick start. Because I do think the M20 quick start is reasonably elegant. I mm. think it is a good intro. Revised also had a good one. We tend to eschew edition wars. There's something crazy and beautiful in all of them. Mm. And the mage community is too small to be rent in half <laughs> like, like yeah. that. As you had mentioned, you used a parent paradox dice system. Can you give us a quick descriptor of what that paradox dice system was? Sure. So it was partly, as I said, there's a lot of cribbing involved from Awakening as well, which is, was recommended heavily to a friend of mine who said, look, they solved most of the problems that Ascension had mechanically mm -hmm. with Awakening, but no, then no one played it. So I went, okay, well, I'm going to see what I can steal from here. Essentially, my what I started doing was I, I found that in the kind of brief experiments I'd had with Mage 3rd Edition, where I, I tried to run it for one person once, which didn't work. One of the things I didn't like was that magic was really, really hard to succeed at. I wanted a different tactic where magic isn't so much that magic's very hard to succeed at. It's that it might be a little bit too easy to succeed at and it's going to tempt you hmm. to do it more. So I wanted that thematically to run into the mechanics. So you have more dice uh, in my version of mage. You have a, a better chance of success. But for every extra th effect that you want to create, if you want to do more damage, if you want to do something at range, if you want it to last longer, you're adding a paradox dice to your dice pool. And we call those temporary paradox points. And if you roll a crit that has a paradox dice involved in it, you're going to succeed too hard and you're going to have a paradox backlash. If you fail 
and you have a one on a paradox dice. You have a, I can't even remember what I called it, but it's a bestial failure in vampire mm -hmm. terms, which is you you failed and got a paradox backlash. So the idea is that you're sitting there going, okay, well, I've got this, I've got this idea for a spell. How hard do I want to juice this? Because the, actually the better I am at casting magic, the more likely I am to crit. The more of these paradox dice I have, the more likely I am to get a paradox crit. So that was the opening idea. And the other idea was that you would gradually accrue permanent, accrue permanent paradox. So if you roll a zero on a paradox dice, even if it's not part of a crit, that becomes permanent paradox. And that's going to be added to all of your pools, all of your magic related pools. Added or replaced? Then on. No matter what you're doing. Oh, sorry. It's replaced. They okay. replace a, a die in your pool. And you don't get any, you don't get a reach for that either. That's just your built up paradox stymying you a little bit which is just making it gradually more and more likely as you go on that you will eventually get a paradox backlash and one change we made about halfway through was one of the things i always like there's a great sequence in a mage book i can't remember which one where a mage fights off the technocracy who are sending androids after him big golden androids and he wakes up a sleeper which then causes the android's magic to fail and i thought that's a cool idea so I did make it uh, that vulgar magic is a little has a higher difficulty to do, and vulgar magic with witnesses also has a higher difficulty. So that was kind of how I implemented that. But in play, it's pretty simple to get your head around. Mm -hmm. It is I make my spells more powerful by adding paradox dice. The more paradox dice I have, the more likely I am to get a backlash. And this was a case just to walk through it. So I am a magus and I am trying to very hastily convince a guard to let me go in somewhere. You had mm -hmm. something called the oh shit roll, which I think was if you don't do any sort of preparation and you just whip a effect out, you just get to roll your rete. Was that the yeah. case? Absolutely. And so I'm trying to bamboozle this guard. And under your rules, I would be rolling a rete plus, say, manipulation. And that would yeah. be my magic pool. Now, I had done some sort of ritual. I had kept up this banter for a while. But you are introducing the reach rules from Awakening, which solves a remarkable amount. It is almost offensive how well that magic system <laughs> works. You're like, yeah, God damn great. it. Why can't we have this? Why can't we have nice things? So under your rules, say I wanted, there were five guards. So well mm. beyond what I could do with a normal thing. Under your paradox rules, I am now, I, I say I had an arete of three and a manipulation of four. I now have seven dice to work with, but yeah. I'm trying to get it to work on multiple people. Am yeah. I adding paradox dice or does some of those seven turn into some paradox? Some of those seven turn into paradox dice. Okay. If you want to affect five people, five of those paradox dice are going to be locked up. And if you don't want to touch each person, you want to do it at that at kind of a small range, you're going mm -hmm. to add a paradox die to that as well. Okay, so suddenly now I'm rolling with one regular die where we just care if it succeeds or fail, and now I've got six paradox dice. Yes. And I roll a bunch of those. Is this a case where we only cared about ones if there were no successes? Or is yes. it one of the... Okay, so say I do I roll this effect and I get three regular... I get a regular success and I get two paradox successes and then two zeros, two crit successes on the paradox dice. So yes. as the storyteller, what then happens? You have a paradox backlash. Okay. Which as a storyteller in this case is kind of similar to a wild surge, I guess. The uh, storyteller is charged with coming up with a sufficiently thematic and hopefully related to the sphere's use way that this succeeds, but something terrible happens to the mage. Paradox gets them somehow. I mean, like uh, an example was Jasmine's character, Marjorie McAllister. She ended up with a paradox backlash that meant that she took willpower damage whenever she swore. So there's some elements of like, uh, I think it would definitely be up to any given storyteller how they wanted to play this. I wanted to do some kind of, make some of it feel a little bit like a drinking game where you're trying to remember something like, okay, I can't swear. And then she goes, oh, fuck. And you go, okay, you take a point of willpower damage. And that will add up very, very quickly. This is something that we can steal in Mage now and, yeah. and make it thematic and say, you have over hypnotic suggested these people. They are now following you around waiting for your next instruction or something yeah. like this. And now exactly. you're pursuing something for the guard like with five guards or something like that. Or you can use the standard retinue of things where you take bashing damage or your hair always blows the opposite direction for the next day when wind comes around. Or you can hear children's music out of the corner, which is distracting on a social roles or you constantly have yeah. to sneeze uh, it's very similar to in my world would be the uh, the flux mechanic in invisible sun where mm -hmm. you, there's too much magic left at the end of the spell and it has to go somewhere and something weird happens you made mention to willpower damage what is that 
So willpower in fifth edition vampire is a little different. In earlier editions, and I believe the same in M20, you can spend a willpower point to get an automatic success. In fifth edition, you can spend a willpower point or take a point of willpower damage to re-roll three non-paradox dice or non-hunger dice to get a better, and you can do that on any roll you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, willpower is very powerful in that sense. Uh, and you want to hold on for it for as long as you can. So what does superficial damage mean? Is there another type then? There's only two damage types. There's superficial and aggravated. Okay. Superficial generally taking the place of bashing and lethal isn't in that edition at all. So aggravated damage is very, very hard to heal, especially aggravated willpower damage. Um, you can actually only heal aggravated willpower damage by making serious progress on your ambition, which is something you select at the uh, start of the game. As you start using your willpower to make these rolls or taking willpower damage in other ways, you can do that by like losing social contests, for example. Eventually you'll fill that all your boxes up with superficial damage and then damage from then on will be aggravated. It works the same way with health, except of course, mages take aggravated damage from most things, which is one of the tougher things to get to because uh, to adjust to, if you've been playing vampire a lot, vampire players don't realize how hard they are to kill until they're a mage. It's like, okay, he shoots at you, you take aggravated damage. You're like, what? Aggravated damage? Like, yeah, it sucks it's to be It's literally human. a bullet, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> of things that kill humans as an yeah, American. It's a rough thing. <laughs> it's up there. <laughs> so what your game version does is health and willpower are now more or less both damage tracks. Yes. So as opposed to willpower, it would be the equivalent of saying, take one point of bashing damage to gain some in-game effect, to uh, strain yeah. against this door and to gain two additional dice on your uh, strength plus athletics roll. Do you use the humanity track at all or something similar to it? We use the humanity track is the wisdom track. Okay. So it, it, exactly the same mechanically, just slightly different thematically. It's, it's just a tracker of how, how much you're losing your shit because of the enormous power that you wield. Is there any way to spend wisdom? No. Okay. Wisdom is just how much hubris you have, essentially. And I guess Arite took the place of blood potency, more or less? Yes, pretty okay. much. One thing I wanted to have was I didn't want to have... I'll confess that I hate the avatar background. I didn't want to have two power stats. I wanted to have one. So Arite and avatar are essentially the same thing. That's how, it's how many dice you're going to have in your magic rolls. And yeah, I did away with avatar completely. Did you change what quintessence did at all? I'm pretty sure the answer is no, but I didn't know if there was a hidden uh, manifestation you used. So quintessence, luckily no one took prime, so I didn't have to figure out how it was going to interact with that. Quintessence is used at the beginning of casting a spell to lower the difficulty by one. And you can use as much as you want. You can, like, if you... And it's up to your arete rating. I'll warn anyone who's going to watch Animal House after this. I call it a ret for the entire game. If that's going to bother anyone, I apologize. I have been told by, I think, every listener, I have literally never pronounced Curdemain correctly. So okay, that's, that's good to hear. That that's fine. I'm literally the mage guy. and I, I think it's kind of like a world of darkness tradition to pronounce stuff wrong, right? Like, there's a reason they have Shimitsi and Bruha in that game, and it's to trip people up. Anytime someone says, it's Camarilla, I'm like, this is why I don't play Vampire. I'm going to play something <laughs> simple. And I run away with my big purple stack of books. Um, <laughs> Quintessence works very similarly. I was this close to renaming it to Mana, <laughs> but I thought that would probably be too much. <laughs> If someone had taken Prime, it would have probably been something you could use to make effect permanent, to enchant things. But the idea was, yeah, in, in, in the context of this game, it was you can make your magic rolls easier. Mm -hmm. Which, if you're rolling a level effect that uses your third sphere uh, and you're doing it vulgar in front of witnesses, you've got a five difficulty roll, which is, is pretty, pretty rough. So you may well want to use some quintessence to re reduce that. So to get back to some more crunchy system bits, since this is V5, when you say difficulty, that is not the target number. That is the total number of dice that need yeah. to show a six or higher, correct? Six yeah. is the target number or is it seven? Six is the target number, yeah. Okay. So every every dice has a 50-50 shot of being a success. Yeah, so if I said a difficulty of three, this actually confused me a lot when I first read the V5 thing. So I went, difficulty of three? I was going <laughs> to I'm going to run rampage in this city. But no, yeah. So difficulty of three is three successes required. Okay. So this is an interesting case where you are giving players more dice, but at the same time, they generally need more successes to have what they want to have happen. Happen. Yeah. How, and I believe you set that difficulty by basically being, it was the highest sphere plus, how did you calculate difficulty? Let me so, say it that uh, way. It's the highest sphere used, add one difficulty for Volga 
add too difficulty for vulgar in front of sleepers. We actually added a little way in. I think that was maybe it was in the second episode. This is a little bit too easy. So I'll just let you know, this is how we're going to change it. Yes, uh, during the encounter with Alpha 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 Alpha, where yeah. um, I knew it was a mage game the moment they got in, and I think within fifteen minutes, everyone had cast four effects. Yeah, and I'm like, yep. This is, Why, this would is, you this believe is my mage. My, my worry was no one's going to cock magic. <laughs> yes. So I actually had a few moments in, in uh, I have another moment in the first episode where I just have a character say, hey, will you show me some magic? Just to kind of get the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they're casting huge time effect immediately. And you want that to happen, right? I don't want people to be scared to cast magic until they've done it a few times and it's backlashed. And then they've gone, oh, maybe I should be scared to cast magic. And that's one of the interesting things about mage. Like when you have your list of vampire powers, there's only so many cases where you want to use dread gaze. Mm-hmm. Uh, but entropy too? I don't know. There's a lot of parties where I want to bring out that trick. I'm just putting Absolutely. it out there. Yeah. You can also tell who the meta gamer is in our group because Kiko had sat there and gone, okay, well, so magic's better if it's coincidental. I'm going to build a character where all that shit is coincidental. Mm-hmm. That was very deliberate on his part. I think he is a he's a power gamer. And so going back to my guy trying to convince a whole bunch of cards example, so that is a a mind to trying to change mood effect. And to me, that effect is is coincidental because you're just trying to convince someone. So under your system, that would just be then difficulty two. Yeah. So assuming I get two successes, everything's golden. Does anything happen with extra successes? That was one of the interesting things where like it was something I thought about a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. And what I decided in the end was that extra successes don't help that much unless it's a crit, because I wanted the focus of the power to be on how many paradox dice you used. So unless you get a crit, all you're trying to do is just beat that score. That's fine. In practice, there might have been a few times, like if someone rolled eight successes, I'm going to go, okay, well, I'm going to, I'll figure out a way (laughs) that this does great because you do want to respect those kind of results. But yeah, generally extra successes don't get you very much. Any extra power you have has to be deliberate, has to be planned for. And you have to be consciously taking that risk. Hmm. So the surprise doesn't come in the degree of effectiveness. The surprise comes if Paradox decides to bite you. Otherwise, the effect yeah. itself should largely be under the mage's control because you're a mage. Yeah, it's, in, it's completely in your control until it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other mage systems or anything else that you grab from V5 or Awakening that either comes in those later episodes that I didn't mention or that you just didn't get a chance to kick the tires on because it didn't come up in play? No, I think we. I think that's mostly it. I say the touchstones and conviction system is the big thing from V five that we brought in. Uh, the idea of the focus skill was a big one that was was a new thing. Which is uh, rather than having too much thing on like here's your focuses, here are your instruments, here's how they differ. Because I I remember reading the quick start and having that explained and thinking, well, I already know how this works and I'm confused. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to be okay. Here's your focus skills. If you're in a situation where you can use them, then you can use that skill as part of your role. If you're not, then it's an oh shit role. Okay. So for instance, Hugo Perez, who's Kiko's character, a lot of his magic was done through talking to people. So his one of his focus skills was insight. Whereas Marjorie McAllister, being a member of the Order of Hermes, her that she was mainly focused on the occult. So she was gonna have to say some magic words, bash the magic staff. You know, I mean, one of the important things was also was that in most cases, you should be able to be disarmed. I thought that was important with a focus. Someone has to be able to take it away from you. Mm-hmm. So with Kiko, if you don't let him talk to you, he can't, he he's going to find it very difficult to use his powers. Well, a Kiko power game. But if you take away Marjorie's staff, it's like, well, you've now got one less string to your bow. I may have in a longer running campaign placed more of a, a focus on instruments and uh, and focuses generally but i did want to kind of keep it moving and keep mm-hmm. it very snappy and uh, so i didn't introduce that stuff but that would probably become more important with time and it's not like the characters were completely disarmed they were just again if someone takes your knife you can still punch them but you'd much rather have the knife if marjorie loses Absolutely. her staff she still has her retay to call on yeah. just not the the other thing which speaking of uh, awakening is kind of similar to the yantra system or the mudra system uh, where you have these other things that you can invoke that represent your your role and your magic and add to it i think those are the game terms for it uh, correct me if i got the wrong ones yeah. you know i might thinking back at now i might say that if you're doing an oh shit role you uh take point of willpower damage okay that makes sense it, like that might be something i would add because it's embarrassing especially if you're a technology based mage kind of tacitly admitting <laughs> that uh you're just that you're doing magic <laughs> 
I like that as an idea. So I think I might, if I if I were able to run it again, I might add that to the system. That it's like just it's taken a little bit out of you to do this outside of your own understanding. One thing we I did also decide after a while was, uh, firstly, something I didn't appreciate before I started was level one spheres are very very good. And secondly, if we rolled on every time someone used a level one sphere, the game was going to slow Come down. Come to a screeching halt. Yeah. So pretty far in, if they weren't trying to do something too crazy, it was just an auto success. Like there's no point when someone's rolling eight dice, and you you don't oh seven dice was was mostly what people were rolling for magic, mm -hmm. and they need to get one success. Unless they're doing something very serious, um, I decided it's not worth rolling this. I, entirely reasonable. How do convictions work? We talked about cuts, uh, touchstones, which kind of represent your the thing that prevents you from drifting off into uh, the world of magic, as well as your wisdom being the ability mm -hmm. to know when and when not to, to mage too much. What were the convictions? How does that system work? So if, if a touchstone is a person who is providing an anchor to prevent you drifting off into your own wizardy world. Convictions are the beliefs that are doing that. Mm -hmm. The convictions don't have to be nice. There's likely to be don't harm the innocent uh, as they are to be nothing must stand in the way of my power. So those are your your kind of self-inflicted rules. The character, the players come up with them. They can be used to ameliorate the loss of wisdom. So for instance, if you have a conviction, protect the weak and you kill someone who's going to kill someone else, even if that, well, I guess there wouldn't necessarily be innocent, but whatever it takes. Then, and I say, well, you're going to have to get a stain on your wisdom tracker for that. Someone could say, well, I was following my conviction, which is to always protect the weak, which is why if you're playing kind of a little bit of a bad guy character, nothing must get in the way of my power is a very powerful conviction. But, you know, also that character is going to be a dick and there's going to be consequences. And what is the penalty to violating your convictions? You, can't, you will receive stains on your wisdom tracker. Okay, so uh, they can be used to prevent stains, but they will also possibly cause it yeah. as well. Okay, mm -hmm. neat. Um, and uh, how much quintessence do mages require to wake up each morning? <laughs> they don't require any okay. at present. I just like the they, idea of yeah. blindly taking literally every V5 system and making it like, yeah. what just were the tradition weaknesses? Straight in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the only rule we have with quintessence which never really came up was that you, in order to get it back, you have to meditate a node. Mm -hmm. You have to take a long rest in D&D terms. Okay. Yeah, um, and it's and it's a lengthy one. It's not just quick. Oh, I'll just uh, just meditate at the old node for a second, and that could potentially cause problems with the animal house chantry because they didn't know where their node was in the beginning of the game. We've all been there, and I'm working actually on uh, another game in my head at the moment where there won't be any node at all, but uh, they won't have access to a node. So those quintessence points will be really pretty precious mm -hmm. because who knows when you're you're going to have to go to a place and do a thing. <laughs> rather than just like, oh, time to go downstairs and meditate, get my magic points back. It sounds like first edition willpower when like the only way you could get it back, it'd be like, you get an automatic success, but the only way to get it, get it back is to see your son smile at you for the first time upon being born. You're like, that seems yeah. like a lift. Yeah, that's, well, that's how you get <laughs> aggravated willpower damage back. But I've never seen anyone playing fifth edition vampire a long time i've never seen anyone dip all the way down to aggravated okay and people just... treat superficial damage like that is how many you have so unless you're going to die generally people don't uh, don't spend those points so just to check i am partially asking because i volunteered to run v5 for gen con because i'm an idiot and i haven't hit it before but uh when you say superficial so you you tick a regular box and then once yeah. that's filled you go back and it becomes and an, it becomes an x okay and likewise if you take an ag point in the first place it, it starts off at that x yeah, it's not okay that just want to yeah. check kind of like uh m20 is but i i thought your your changes flowed naturally and it was a little almost jarring how since the a lot of the players knew v5 already they were not thrown off by like skill plus a rite. This is wrong. They just looked at you and they're like, okay, skill plus a rite. Like they had been yeah. doing it forever. So like, it was like we got to peek in into an alternate universe where M5 had been out for a year and you were just doing. <laughs> well, that was what I, that was really what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to feel like, okay, this is Mage 5th edition. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure Mage 5th edition, when it actually comes out, will be considerably more robustly play tested. Whereas I was, uh, as they say, deploying code in production. The first time <laughs> I ever played this system was live on it. 
thank you so much for that rundown of of the system you would come up with. If people are interested in seeing it live, we will include links to the show notes or alternately mm-hmm. just look on YouTube for Mage, Animal House, Penny Arcade, some yeah. combination of those words. But the other part of this is this was an actual play. I do a podcast. Even when I do actual plays on the podcast, I have the benefit of editing. Uh, mm. How does running a game that is going to be broadcast live differ from maybe something that has the benefit of recording and being edited? Does that change your style of storytelling or how you approach a session? Yes. You have to be able to roll with the punches and you can't check the book. Those are my kind of things. Like I've been on been in games where people have checked the book occasionally because sometimes you just have to. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, I generally don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have uh, to check. And there are a few edit points in Animal House, I think, that we have because of barking dogs and other mm-hmm. things like that. Um, but they they were pretty subtle, and we're generally trying to go from front to back without mm-hmm. any pauses. So you have to be able to roll with punches. As a storyteller, you just have to be able to improvise in the moment. Mm-hmm. If they come up with something that surprises you, you don't have anywhere to hide. You can't even go, let me just think. Okay, so if you said that to Bill, you, which you can do at home, mm-hmm. or you can say to everyone, okay, everyone, we're going to take a five-minute break. Yeah. You can only take your five minute break when it's time for the five minute break. So yeah, it's it's heavily on the improv and it is is heavily against the rules lawyer because you just don't you don't have time to be a rules lawyer. You don't have time to check the book. And it seemed like there were even a few cases where you had said something and even if the player thought you were wrong, they just went with it. And there were other cases where it was obvious that you were flummoxed or it appeared that you were flummoxed, that another character bought you time to think. By them yeah. rambling or saying, well, uh, now that she said that, I think this is what my character thinks. And, and that seemed like a case of a, a generous table. Do you think those are things that are useful for regular games to try every once in a while? I think so. And I think like when you say a generous table, I think a table that helps everyone out is a good table. One of the things I always see in terms of like people asking the most common DMing question generally across any game line is, one of my players is a complete shithead. What should I do about it? And there's a million different ways that that would be phrased uh, and a million different behaviors. But generally, that's that's the crux of it. And the answer is, oh, don't play with them. Tell them you're not part of this group anymore. And that's the real advantage that I knew going in is no one's going to sabotage mm-hmm. me. They aren't going to do like even the, the easiest way of, of messing up a storyteller is, OK, so we, you're, you're here at the Chantry and there's four different puzzles that have been put in front of you. Like I go to the pub. Premise rejection, as Robin yeah, Wallace I do would say. It. Yeah. Premise rejection is that I'm going to use that from now on. I'm stealing that. I knew that people weren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to be on our side. And I would say that that should be true of anyone who's running a game. Mm -hmm. The player should be on your side because you're also a player. You're at the table to have fun, whether you're doing it for for an audience or not. Having fun is an important part of it. Your players, there should be the expectation that you're not going to try and just shit on the DM. And that's one of those ones where I am amazed at how often that comes up in one shots. Mm-hmm. where you're like, you're playing Call of Cthulhu, there's an empty tomb. What the heck did you think this game was going to consist of? Yeah. And when someone says the reason why their character won't engage with it, one of the replies a GM can have is, okay, so what's a different character that you can play that you think would actually yeah. care about that? And um, again, all credit to Robin Laws and Ken Height for kind of coming up with that framework. It's good to let them have that moment of like, this sounds really dangerous. I'm not sure if we do it all. This sounds like a trap. But there should be the understanding like, hey, I've written this encounter. Please eventually go to the encounter. And as a storyteller, part of your job when you're writing the background for this is to make it compelling and make it like, okay, so there's a reason why they want to do this. There was a a friend that I talked to about the prep for Mage Animal House. And one of his things is saying, okay, but why do they do that? And a lot of the time you trip me up. And I was like, I don't know if I've given them a reason why. And then you go back to the drawing board and you go, okay, well, here's a reason. And that is just going to create a more coherent world, even if you're not worried about the players trying to screw you up. And that is something that a storyteller can hand back to the player. Once we have the presumption that the characters are going to go on the MacGuffin quest, you can say, what do you think is in this for your character? Or what is the secret motivation you think your character has for this? And that mm-hmm. is often an opportunity as a storyteller to add a plot hook or like, oh, I, I hear this is really valuable. My character has a bunch of debts. It's on their character sheet. You completely forgot about it. And suddenly you have a motivation and another reason uh, to play with. So that goes in the don't hesitate to hand it back to the players once they've kind of even agreed to it, if you're trying to build out that motivation. Mm-hmm. If someone wants to run a recorded actual play, there are a couple of them floating around for Mage, but I certainly wouldn't argue if there were more. Do you have any recommendations on the nuts and bolts of that? On some of the things that uh, the first few times you were doing it tripped you up that maybe you hadn't anticipated? I would say generally keep it as simple as you can. 
to start out with. Start at ground level. Even if your plan is eventually like everyone is going to be in the umbra, they're going to be shapeshifted into a giant eagle. They're going to be fighting some crazy bastard who, who exists only as a notion. They're going to be fighting the color blue. Start out with a mugging. <laughs> like start out with something that is easy for everyone to get their head around. And at the mage power level, like a lot of those small street level problems aren't actually going to be great problems. Like they're not going to be big. You can solve them with magic. But definitely start out simple. Start out as uh, as relatable as you can before you get into the wacky stuff. And that's both for your players and for your audience. Because if you start out too wacky, the audience is just, you're going to lose the audience. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that mundane events can have a lot of stakes if they're tied into the characters. The second episode of Mage, I believe the quest is uh, go to a place and take a thing. Someone has stolen something, go and get it back. And that's a very simple quest that could be good or could be bad. It sounds really simple, but then you added to it, oh, well, a character who's taken it is Lily and Lily's fucked. So she's, you know, now you, so it's going to be horrifying trying to get it back. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to deal with this strange character and maybe combat isn't the best way to deal with them. And you're not really sure whether combat is the best way to deal with them because you can't get a read on them. Then people are invested in that, even if the answer is, well, I'm pretty sure if I just set fire to it, she'll die. And also like the idea of like, well, I, the, the person that they're taking this quest for, they should care about that. Like, why are you, okay, go and get the MacGuffin from the place. What is the MacGuffin? And the MacGuffin is, well, it's my magic sword and I love my magic sword. Then you've got, okay, well, that's a simple quest. Maybe they'll still go and get the magic sword. But in the case of this character, it's like, well, this is my this is my spirit egg. This is how my wife and I pass on our gifts to our children. I should say, because that sounds like a complete non sequitur, that is something I cribbed from Werewolf. Uh, and the character in question was a were-raven. Yeah, once you go Korax, you'll never want more X. Yes, that's absolutely it. That's the watchword of the whole series. So start with things that are simple, but try and find a way to make them interesting and trying to find a way to make them emotionally resonant. You know, have characters and NPCs feel feelings, have them be scared of people, have them be sad at something's happening, like pull at the heartstrings a little bit. And you can make even something very simple, very compelling. There's a temptation, especially with Mage, for a more is more approach. You can do all this wacky stuff. So let's, let's start out crazy. Let's start out with the, the craziest shit that we can imagine. And I think that it's much easier to start building stuff up from the ground up. I mean, if we played Animal House for another 10 years, by the end of those 10 years, they would be doing extremely strange things and we would be having wild and wacky adventures. But I had four episodes. So, so it's like, okay, then it has to be something everyone understands immediately. I'd also try and reduce jargon as much as you possibly can. One criticism I have of Mace the Awakening is it is extremely jargon heavy to the point where when I actually read through it, I, I, I remember screenshotting a paragraph of it and sending it to my friend saying, why did you make me read this? Yeah, it's just uh, run on sentences that are entirely consistent yeah. of capital nouns. Absolutely, that's it. Like try and reduce the nouns as much as you can. Don't make the players deal with too much stuff discourage them from taking prime because no one knows what prime does i was glad that no one took prime and no one took spirit someone took spirit i was like how am i gonna make this useful <laughs> spirit to me is like when you're playing a multiplayer game and someone is a sniper like mm -hmm. they're fundamentally playing like a mini game off to the side that periodically results in other people dying that's yeah. it's <laughs> it's almost causally disconnected from it you you've had a lot of good advice you've had a lot of good input i i loved seeing your your demonstration of the system it was a good show that mage can be run for people who haven't read the phone book that is yeah. our that is our holy text i guess i would say that i'd say that the restriction that i had of my players aren't going to want to read the phone book is probably universal. Unless you have four people who have all been reading Mage for years and wanted to play it. You can start, hey, we're playing this game called Mage. You're going to want to reduce the reading as much as you possibly can. So I think that's something that is definitely true both in actual plays and when you're playing at home is just keep it simple, make it digestible. And then when people are excited about it, they're going to go and read. They're going to want to read more of the book. I remember there's a moment in Animal House where Jasmine's character, Marjorie McAllister, says, well, as an adeptus and a rank three in, in the Order of Hermes. And I went, oh, she went and read the book. I didn't read that bit. Cheater. Yeah. <laughs> and that, to me, was a good sign because it was like, okay, Jasmine's a very busy lady and she was interested enough that she went back and, and read on her own stuff that where I didn't say, can you please read this? Because we really need you to read. 
that's a good sign. Like your players will want more of this world, but you just got to give them a just give them a snippet at first. Give them a digestible chunk. You made mention that you gave your players a uh, a quick reference. Is that something that we can pass to our audience? So there is a quick reference. There is a there is a a guide to it already published that is on um, Club PA, which is patreon.com forward slash Club PA. It's okay. uh, Penny Arcade's premium premium Patreon service. For a dollar, you can access that post. Okay. There is some question as to whether or not, because I did that when I was an employee of theirs, okay. they own it. Got it. So I don't know if I can reproduce it and just hand it out to everyone. There probably wouldn't be a problem, but is it there... would technically be copyright infringement, I think. You are a multi-talented content producer as we are sitting on this Zoom call and no one else can see. From what I understand, your great courses, accents, pardon me, Skillshare, I think that's the current thing that uh, YouTube is, everything is sponsored by. Your Skillshare course on Skillshare course on accents should be out anytime. What other endeavors do you have in the creative world that our audience may be curious about? So uh, I'm currently predominantly, I'm not playing in any actual plays at the moment, but I am a musician and I release uh, music under the name Patrick McNamara. Or the Patrick McNamara problem. I have two albums available in that that name, and I have a Patreon, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash Patrick McNamara, M C N A M A R A. You can tell I've spelled that out on a lot of phone lines. By pledging to that, you can get access to a lot of fun music. And one of the stretch goals for that Patreon is to create a new Mage actual play. I think this is the this is the probably the the most announced it's ever been. But yeah, I would do a, a Mage actual play currently. Uh, working title is Mage of Sail. Uh, so you're doing something involving boats. Are you going to have Mage Capital Ship combat rules? Yes. <laughs> there will be ship-to-ship combat. We will see how uh, the mundanities of firing cannons interact with uh, the wild world of magic. Uh, uh, I don't have any idea how it's going to go, which is very exciting and and certainly suited for uh, a Mage game. I, I think we can all agree that no game book has ever been padded out by adding capital ship combat rules. So I look Absolutely, forward to seeing yeah. that. So if that sounds like something you're interested in and you also want to listen to some rock music, uh, go ahead and give patreon.com forward slash Patrick McNamara a little listen. A lot of the music is uh, is free, um, but by pledging, you can get access to it earlier. You can also find me on twitch.tv forward slash Patrick McNamara. I went with a consistent spelling across uh, all the different sites uh, where I create the music. Uh, for two hours every day, I do music production and I uh, track, edit and mix music live on air, which is an incredibly stressful thing to do. I don't know why I started doing it. <laughs> it's been a fun project management tool because you have this thing like, well, I have to work on music for two hours every day. And it's also interesting as a creative to do an exercise like that because it makes you realize, oh, you will come up with something. There is no such thing as writer's block. Yeah. There is yeah. just insufficient motivation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, to watch Adam Neely come up with an album seemingly in 24 hours. Oh, like, yeah, actually, I saw that stream and I was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> you're, making it, you're making people think that that's something we can just do. <laughs> but, like, the reality of it is that as soon as I started doing it, I found out, oh, you can do this. And there's been a number of times where I've finished something on a Thursday and gone, oh, no, Thursday is a terrible time to finish something. Now I have to come up with something by Friday instead of coming up with it by Monday. But somehow 10 a.m. rolls around. And you have an idea because you have to. And that is also, that's how I'm going to tie this back in. Look at this amazing you the storyteller takeaway. connection here. Yeah. A great skill for a storyteller. Mm -hmm. What happens when my player does something fucking wacky that I could not possibly have anticipated? And the answer is you roll with it. You'll come up with something. And you memorialize that with the MVP. What was the that? The MVP award. It comes from one of a D&D &D show that is also produced by Penny Arcade called the C Team, always had most valuable player at the end, and it had to be an inanimate object. When we started doing a vampire game, we then had most vampire player, who was the person who most embodied the spirit of a vampire during that play. For Mage, we had MVP stood for Magic versus Patrick, which is which person most successfully derailed my game using Magic. Although on, on one occasion, they did use a speedboat, won the Magic versus Patrick award because I had written a car chase and they're like, what if we get a boat? Well, then I don't have anything ready for that. But yeah, the Magic versus Patrick Award, I think people like to receive it. It's all in good humor. And I, I definitely recommend that people change their name to Patrick if they don't already have a P-based name. Might want to rephrase that. A name that starts with P. Uh, and introduce it to your own games.
I, I certainly agree with that. There was, uh, as someone who's run Mage a lot and run it a lot for first timers, I think I did the math and sometime in the last three months, I have spent more time running one shots and introductory sessions for Mage than all of my time running a extended table game combined. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> So someone's got to do the evangelizing the moment when they just pieced out from that car in the first thing I'm like, Oh no, that was a, there was a plan for this. Yeah, that, was <laughs> that was for sure. That was big. And it, like, and it went off flawlessly as well. That was the thing like, Oh, they're doing big magic. This is going to go really badly. No, nope. <laughs> just rolled brilliantly, but not too well. Yeah. There was never, there... <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was great. Ooh, I mean, they, every just, guy was just great a players and it, it was always a, a pleasure to see what they came up with. I hope I get to play it more, but it's, it's probably unlikely that I'll be playing, uh, a, too many further animal house games. I should say that we did just do a one shot with the animal house crew for a great charity called draw for charity. Um, and if you look that up, that's still on video on demand. And they're a, they're a great charity to watch. If you're interested in more Animal House, that's probably where more one shots will materialize. Awesome. And your mage game gets off the ground and you would like to come back and talk about that. We would love to hear what you're up to. You're innovating in the space of uh, shoving mage into people's lives. And I certainly appreciate Absolutely. that. Patrick, thank you so much. That would be a great pleasure. Thank you too. This has been Mage the Podcast, where we'd let you re-roll Paradox Dice by spending willpower, as long as you didn't make too much of a habit out of it. Patrick mentioned several M5 rules that are available as part of Club Penny Arcade, and I've included a link to that in the show notes. You do need to be a member of their Patreon to get it. Additionally, if you're an executive producer, as a thanks, I'll be typing up a two-page M5 quick reference based on this conversation that will eventually be made public after it is made available to the executive producers as a preview. It's going to take me a few weeks to do this. Please note the ultimate publication, I think, would need to be dark packed, so it won't be on the Storyteller's Vault, but as things develop, I'll be sure to announce it. The show is made possible by our executive producers, who are in roughly alphabetical order. Alexander Gorton, Anders S., Andrew Edelstein, Andy, Umberto, Boogers, 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 Brendan Morrill, Bryce Perry, Chris Sack, Dan Svensson, Dennis Osborne, Entropy underscore Prime, Freddy, Garga Lo Noir, Guy Conan Stewart, Ian, Isabel Castillo, Jason Vines, Jay Sunsern, Jenna F., John Horton, John Magnuson, Josh Golden, Josh H., Josh Heath, Leslie Weatherstone, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Nibero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Ralph Scheinhammer, Richard Bat Brewster, Ryan Hilton, Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, William Connolly, and William Martin. Additionally, I would like to thank our two oracles, Christopher Phillips, who is the oracle of dice that are slightly out of balance, or at least they seem like that, but they're actually completely fair, and Buck Farmer, the oracle of toast, the 10th sphere of zero commercials in the 90s when seemingly anything could be part of a healthy breakfast. Our EP shout-out this episode is to Nibero, who's a regular participant in the Mage the Podcast Discord, discord.me slash podcast. And I appreciate them bringing a non-American view to the game. I have dim hopes that I can convince them to do a Brazil setting book. And if you think that's a good idea, join our Discord and gently prod them along with me. Neb, your kid looks adorable. And I hope your entropy effects bringing you good luck never fall to paradox. You too can become an executive producer at patreon.com slash mates the podcast. And if you super like this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at mates the podcast at mates the podcast at gmail.com or at mates the podcast on Twitter. We have a hop in Discord community at discord.me slash mates the podcast. You can subscribe to our show all over the place, but more importantly, please share it with a friend. And you can go to madesthepodcast.com for all of our previous show notes. Now, go change reality. Bye.